might say, like, what does that have to do with the Bible reading that we did last week? Because we're in a series where we're just following through uh, on a system, reading through the Bible. And by the way, if you want to get in on that system and you don't know, we somewhere I believe we have here some uh, um, some cards. Obviously, we're we're late into the year, but you can certainly jump in. We're in the uh, New Testament now in the Gospels. We're going through Mark, finishing up Mark this week and going into Luke. But uh, it's always, it's never too late to jump in and follow along. It's nice every week to know that we're somewhat on the same page uh, there. So uh, the for this sermon, though, I'm not necessarily covering the content that we read last week. I decided to do something a little bit different. And since we're going through Mark and we're getting ready to start Luke, and having already read through Matthew, I was thinking, you know what, we might talk about the uh, authors and the different gospel accounts. I've always thought it was so cool that we have four different gospel accounts because all of them are, you know, very similar and they don't contradict each other, uh, but they are just different enough to give us little insights, you know. You want to read one completely through. It's kind of hard if you read a chronological Bible and you see them all spliced in there, but if you read it all the way through, you get that full picture, but then when you read the other account and get the full picture, it adds some insight that you didn't notice to the other one, and it gives you this kind of like three-dimensional view of what's going on, and it's really nice, but some people don't know maybe uh, much about the four Gospels, and so, and here's the thing, like, if you look up, and you're welcome to do it, I don't, I'm not afraid of anybody reading books and learning and stuff like that, but if you want to read modern uh, scholarship on the Bible, just do it with a grain of salt, okay, because, uh, you know, a lot of these guys aren't even saved, like, some of them are even atheists, they're, they're like the top Bible critics, and then you get all these Bible, so-called Bible scholars like referring to them for things like the authorship of the of the book of the Bible or the you know authenticity and stuff like that, and it's really bizarre. So you kind of it's not even worth it sometimes. But if it's interesting to you, you're certainly welcome to read that. I'm, I don't ever stop anyone from reading anything. But let me see. Maybe I'll do it this way. So we understand that the gospel accounts that we have are Matthew. Mark, Luke, and John, okay? Now, let me just tell you a couple things about these different books. So, they typically call these the synoptic uh, gospels. They're all very synonymous. Like, they, they really, you, you can read them, and there's not a whole lot of differences. Like, they're, uh, I'll explain that more in a minute. Whereas, John, if you read it, it seems quite a bit different again not contradicting anything but it just it reads different it it, it, uh, it handles certain situations a little more spiritually than uh, than just kind of factually uh, like these so so this is kind of isolated book in and of itself now mark is the smallest book and we're talking about who mark is and all that stuff that's what the message is about but uh, just to give you a little bit of a background mark is the smallest of the gospels so some have tried to say that he just took the works of Matthew and Luke and kind of like, you know, gave an abbreviated, you know, uh, uh, gospel there. And then others, modern scholarship, again, take it with a grain of salt, but modern scholarship says, well, actually, I think maybe he wrote the first one. And then these two other sources, you know, they kind of copied off of him and added stuff that he didn't have there. And it's like they just want to really make it way complicated, all right? But... But really, I believe that, now here's another thing that the scholar, they, they try to deny every single one of these. Like if you say, like, this is the author of the book, they'll say, no, I don't think it is. And they'll just decide that it's some anonymous author, okay? And I'll say this, but we really don't have a signature. Like, you know, you don't read the book and know exactly who the authors are. The only thing you really have is what, what's been passed down and in the heading or the, the title of the book, it'll say, you know, gospel according to Mark or, or whatever. And it's just kind of been traditionally accepted. Now, there's a problem, too, because what's tradition has usually been passed down from the Catholic Church. And we don't agree with a lot of what, the, what they say. So you're tempted to say, like, well, it's probably all wrong. But to me, it just kind of makes sense, especially the way it was worked down. And here's what I think. I think this is actually in the order that they were written. Matthew was... Uh, also called a Levi, like he was the tax collector who was a Jew, and he started following Jesus. It kind of makes sense. He's good at keeping records and all that stuff. He probably followed 
and uh, began to keep track of what they were doing. All right, and at some point um, later on, the, uh, there were men who were able to sit down with the apostles. Now, we don't know if Mark or Luke were uh, actually there. Like, they seem like they were pretty young if you study a little bit about their life. So they might not have been there when Christ was there, or it might have been like really little kids whenever Christ was there. But as we'll see about Mark, and the same is true with Luke, they were able to be around the apostles, and they were able to, to, to work with them and preach with them and travel with them. And no doubt, uh, they both were keeping records and, and taking notes. Now, about Luke, and Luke, by the way, is the most accepted, like most scholars would agree that he is the author of Luke in uh, Acts as well. They kind of go together as a running book. So, and you can kind of follow through uh, and see where he, why, why that would make sense, like even without seeing his name at the title. But, um, but he, we know the Bible says he was a physician. So again, thinking about detail, if you read his book, it's real detail oriented. And, and uh, so I believe that later on, and this would have been like, tr- he would have been traveling around with Paul, the apostle, and so that shows you the timeline. If Matthew was writing his book while he was actually with the, the disciples, because uh, he was one of the disciples, and then Mark later on, which I'll talk about in the message, and then Luke traveling around with the Apostle Paul, you can see how they would have developed theirs later. Now, John was also an apostle, so he was an eyewitness to these things, but he's also the one that wrote Revelation, and this was like, probably most people accept as being kind of the later book that was written of course revelation being like really late like some people have said as late as as 90 a.d i don't i don't i would think probably more like 70 a.d but that's another um another subject so these are the four different accounts that we have now let me break down just real quickly if you read mark mark is going to agree with matthew and luke Again, this is just going off of what scholars say, okay? But they're going to say that they agree 90% of the time, okay? So if you read a parable, let's say, in Mark, you're probably going to find it in Matthew or Luke uh, because you can find a lot of those uh, there, which means 10% is unique. So there are a handful of things, stories that weren't told in uh Matthew or Luke, but for the most part, you're going to find those. And then, of course, Mark and John both start off with John the Baptist. They don't even address Jesus' birth, whereas Matthew and Luke take a lot of time discussing Jesus' birth and all that kind of stuff. Okay, So I'm just giving you a little bit of an understanding of, of these and then leave this up here so that if I come back and point to them, maybe you'll have in your head what I was just talking about, okay? But we're going to talk about Mark right now and who I believe it is that wrote that book and a little bit about him. And so let's see if there's anything that I wanted to tell you that I, that I didn't that was important. Nope, nothing's important. Okay. Okay, so number one, let's see who Mark was. Mark was, the, and by the way, this is going to be, a, it's not just a, a, you know, a, like a history lesson or, or something like that. There's going to be some application here, primarily to anybody who thinks that what they do for the Lord isn't as noteworthy or as profitable as somebody else. Okay, the purpose of this message, I'll tell you right now, is to encourage you that you could be doing something for the Lord. You should be doing something for the Lord, and you're valuable to the Lord. You just got to be willing to do something, you're willing to work and to, and to try to do something, and God is faithful to bless that and allow you to do something great for the Lord, okay? Uh, and, and, and so this is the idea that I want to show you with Mark, or also called John Mark, okay? So let's go to Acts chapter 12. We're not even going to be in Mark at all, but uh, but you'll, you'll find out where we're going here. Okay, so Acts chapter 12. And look at verse 12. We see that Mark was the son of a woman named Mary. Now, there's lots of Marys in the Bible. Uh, so, who, you know, we don't know if she's been mentioned before or what. But it's a woman who accommodates the disciples And Mark is her son. Acts chapter 12, verse 12. And when he had considered the thing 
he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark, uh, where many were gathered together praying. Okay, so Peter, you know, they're praying for him. He's bound up, and then the Lord releases him, and he, and he gets out, and so then he goes to Mary's house where he knows the disciples are meeting. Okay, so we don't know much about this Mary necessarily, but we do know this, that she is the sister of Barnabas, okay, who becomes a very influential in the book of Acts, an influential character who takes uh, the apostle Paul under his wing and, uh, and then is a partner with him for a little while and all this. So go to Acts, I mean, go to um, Colossians chapter 4. Colossians chapter 4. Uh, what did I do here? Colossians chapter 4. That's not right. Um, what am I looking for here? Maybe it is. Ah, that's embarrassing. What did I do here? All right. Uh, let me look something up. Is it 410? Thank you. You might have saved me. It's verse, yes, yeah, verse 10. Thank you. Whoever did, whoever said that. Verse 10. Uh, Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, salute you, and Marcus, okay, this is Mark, sister's son to Barnabas, touching whom you receive commandment, if ye come unto you, receive him. Man, thank you, I was starting to sweat. Okay, so, uh, so yeah, so we, we see that this Barnabas would be Mark's uncle. Now, that's going to become important later on to the story, uh, that this is Barnabas' nephew, uh, is, is Mark. Now, we know that Mary had a house, this Mary that we're talking about. She has a house because they're all meeting there. Okay? We also know if you study, uh, go ahead and go to Acts 4 real fast. We're going to jump around a lot. Acts chapter 4. Look at verse 37. Okay, so this is talking about Barnabas in verse 36, a Levite of the country of Cyprus, having land, sold it and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. So Barnabas had a bunch of land, sold it, and he uses this money. So we see Barnabas having land, his sister owning a house, which, by the way, back then, owning land and owning houses was, was not it's not just like everybody had that. This is what a lot of times a bunch of people would live together in one big house uh, and uh, they would share responsibilities and stuff like that. Uh, but in this case, it gives us the idea, and this is important to the story here, it gives us the idea that they came from a family that probably had wealth. Okay? Barnabas and his sister, their parents probably had a successful business or something like that, and they had the means, okay, and they were using that. Barnabas sold it and said, hey, I'm following the Lord. We'll just send this money. We'll just put it in, and, and I'm just all in. You know, who knows how he was doing on other finances or whatever, but he sold this property and gave it to uh, the disciples. And then also uh, his sister is using her property to house the disciples. They can meet there, have church service, have prayer meetings, whatever, meeting at their house. And so Mark, I don't know his age, but we know he's living at home. We know that, uh, you know, his, his, his mom's there. He's around the disciples. We know that uh, Barnabas, Uncle Barnabas, right, it's a man of God, and he's there present in his life uh, somehow. And it's possible that Mark, John Mark, could have even been a little bit spoiled, right, to some degree. Now, honestly, most of us in here are probably spoiled to some degree, right? If I'm honest, thinking about my house, like there are times where my kids probably think, 
uh, and they're really good. They've never had this kind of an attitude or spirit, but sometimes maybe thinking like, oh, how come I don't have this, and I don't have the nicest, you know, this thing or that thing, and all of us might feel like that sometimes, but come on, man, we are all spoiled. <laughs> we got everything that we need, and uh, you know what? If we don't have it, we can get it from the government, right? They'll give us a handout, <laughs> you know, we got whatever we want. There's really no, me there's no, no reason to, uh, you know, to suffer to the extent that somebody, when it says poor saints, for instance, when the Bible says the poor saints in Jerusalem, it wasn't saying like, hey, they're a little behind on a bill or something like that. It's like they're starving. They're not, they're looking for their next meal. You know what I mean? So, uh, so in this case, Barnabas, it seems like, and his sister, they probably came from, uh, you know, wealthy means, didn't really have to worry about those things. It's possible John Mark kind of came up that way too. Didn't ever have to suffer a whole lot. Well, didn't have to go without a whole lot. Uh, that's certainly uh, possible. Okay, so Mark is the son of this woman and the nep nephew of Barnabas. All right, so number two, let's look at this. Mark goes along with Paul and Barnabas on their first missionary journey. Look at Acts chapter 12. So... Real quickly, and I'm doing, I'm doing the, uh, I've got a bunch of, we just, we're now in the New Testament, right? And it's like all these messages are starting to mingle together. together. We've got two series going on. I've got the uh, Life of Paul, and I've got the New Testament Church. I'm doing it on Thursdays. And so really a lot of them are starting to mingle together. And so this morning in Iola, I was preaching on the Life of Paul, but I was talking about Antioch and how Antioch became this hub for Christianity and here's, in a nutshell, how it came about, okay? You had the early disciples, they're meeting and they're praying, they're staying in Jerusalem until eventually there's going, you know, a lot of people are getting saved, especially Acts 2. They all come from all these different regions, also probably as far as Antioch. And, uh, and eventually some of them get saved, but, uh, you know, they go to their hometowns. That church there in Jerusalem ends up being persecuted during the time of Saul, and Stephen, after he gets martyred, they all spread, spread, and they go as far as Antioch. And eventually, people in Antioch start getting saved. There's some exciting things going on. And uh, the disciples, like Peter and, and some of the other disciples, are still there in Jerusalem. And they get word that, hey, things are going on. They're, man, the, the word of God is being spread around. People are getting saved in Antioch. And ultimately, the way I understand it is that Peter eventually goes to Antioch, and he becomes the pastor there. It's much like if, I mean, if you think about what we got going on in our church right now. Okay. So, uh, I was, I, I am the pastor of Iola Baptist temple. And then we started this work out here and, and there were some guys involved and in going soul winning and all this kind of stuff. And so we said, Hey, let's go out there and start something. See what happens. All of a sudden people getting saved, people joining the church, things are happening. So it would be like if I moved from Iola and I believe that James became the pastor of the Church of Jerusalem. So it'd be like if I came to Kansas City and said, that's it, I'm going to focus on here. I'm going to oversee this church. And then we're going to put somebody else over in Iola to continue things, things there. That's kind of what happened. And so Antioch then becomes this hub. And they send uh, Paul and Barnabas to go off. And they get their crew. They get their members. They develop a missionary team. And they go out to preach the gospel. And you can follow their journeys. A lot of people have drawn maps. You can look online and see maps of their first journey, second journey, third journey. And, uh, and, and well, B Paul and Barnabas did the first journey together, and then they split up. But, uh, but there's different missionary journeys. And each time they come back to Antioch and they give report, much like missionaries do today. Like they'll come back on furlough, give a report to their sending churches. And this is kind of uh, what happens. So this is Antioch becomes this really big uh, hub for Christianity. And Paul and Barnabas now are going to be sent out from that church to go on a missionary journey. And they say, let's take John Mark, Barnabas's nephew. Okay. So you got the apostle Paul. If you know anything about him, this guy's on a mission, man. This guy is a hard worker. You got Barnabas, also a very hard worker, also a man that loves the Lord and is willing to work. Also a very passionate guy. Which, which the Apostle Paul should know because he's the one that actually took Paul under wing and helped him whenever the disciples were afraid of him and didn't want to accept him into the membership. He took him and, and vouched for him and got him in there. So now you got these three. 
And there's other people that are on the team too, but these are the ones I was talking about. You got Paul, Barnabas, and then Barnabas' nephew, John Mark, the author of the, the Gospel According to Mark. So he goes with them on this journey, and look at Acts chapter 12, verse 25. It says, And Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem when they had fulfilled their ministry and took with them John, whose surname was Mark. Okay, now look at chapter 13, verse 5. And when they were at Salamis, they preached the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews, and they had also John to their minister. Okay, look at verse 13. Now when Paul and his company loosed from Pamphus and came to Persia in Pamphylia, and John departed from them, returned to Jerusalem. Okay, so as you're reading about these, this travel, this first missionary journey, here's what you see. You got Paul and Barnabas on a mission, and they're going. And you got to read all the story to, to get all of this, but they are on this mission, and the first thing they do is sail from the coastline there, and they sail to uh, Cyprus. Okay, and I don't know how long of a journey that is, but it's quite a while on a, a boat. Now, anybody in here ever been on a boat, maybe a cruise or something? Like maybe, uh, I'm not even talking about like a fishing boat, but maybe if you've been on a fishing boat for a long time, you've experienced seasickness. Anybody ever got that? Anybody get motion sickness? I do. And so if I'm in a car for very long and I'm not driving, I'm probably going to throw up. I can't imagine myself on a cruise ship. All right, it's, uh, it, it just sounds like something that would probably be miserable really quickly. And then, you know, they always talk about all these, like, uh, buffets. You can eat all that you want or whatever. I don't think I'd want to eat anything on a cruise <laughs> because I'd be sick the whole time, right? So imagine now John Mark say, yeah, this is going to be great. I'm going to go with, with Paul and, and with Uncle Barnabas, and we're going to go on this missionary journey. We're going to have a great time. We're going to turn the world upside down for Christ. And then he gets on the ship, and he's like this minister. It says they, they had John to their minister. What's that mean? Hey, he probably does, did some cleaning. He probably did some cooking. <laughs> you know, he probably uh, ran errands for them and, and did all the work. And, and I'm sure that they were constantly on him. Hey, go get us this. Hey, go get us that. Hey, we need some. You know, and they're, he's following around. Imagine now he's on this ship going to Cyprus, starts realizing, hey, man, I don't think my stomach's going to handle this, uh, this traveling. Okay, then they get to Cyprus. Now, I, I looked it up, and Cyprus is, but I forgot. I looked it up, but I forgot. It's like 240 kilometers, which works out to like 100, and I'm just going to guess here, like 50. Anybody know the ratio of kilometers? To, it's like 150 miles or something like that from one end to the other, you know. So if they walked all the way through all the place in, in Cyprus, this little island, Okay, if they walked all through that, preaching the gospel, we're talking about days and days of walking. You know, some of us here recently felt like what it feels like to walk 40 miles or, you know, whatever. And, and, and you know, we understand, hey, this, this is pain. And I'm hungry and I'm tired and all this kind of stuff. And, and, you know, man, the Apostle Paul, if you read about his life, you realize that, uh, that you know, he went through some stuff. You know, let's go to, uh, oh man, let's see if I can figure out. <sighs> let's see. Let's go to 2 Corinthians 11. 2 Corinthians 11. Let's read, this is Paul's testimony of what life was like as a missionary. Not today's missionaries, okay? I mean, maybe some of them, but this is life as a missionary in Paul's day. Okay, uh, 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 2 Corinthians 11, verse 24. <clears throat> of the Jews, five times received I forty stripes, save one. All right, so five times he's whipped, you know, and, or beaten on in his back, uh, 39 times, right? And that happened five different occasions. Thrice was I beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Thrice I suffered shipwreck. A night and a day I have been in the deep. 
in journeyings often in perils of war. Who, who's to say that Mark wasn't with Paul and Barnabas one day whenever they're going up the hillside or something like that and some robbers came and, and, and threatened them or stole from them, you know? Who knows what Mark went through as he's following the Apostle Paul? In perils by my own countrymen, in perils of the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and painfulness, in watchings often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness, besides those things that are without that which cometh upon me daily, the care of all the churches. And so the Apostle Paul is just saying like, hey, it's not been an easy life serving the Lord as far as the physical nature goes, as far as suffering and, and going through tribulation and, and trials. And so he's going through all of this. And uh, we find that in chapter thir Acts chapter 13, verse 5, uh, that the, the uh, or actually uh, verse 13, Mark bails on them at Pamphylia. Okay, now that's only a third of the way into their missionary journey. So you got from the coastline to Cyprus, however long that is, all, who knows how many days they're in Cyprus going about preaching the gospel, hiking on foot, trying to find place to stay, place to eat, all this kind of stuff. Now, I think Barnabas was from Cyprus, so maybe they had some connections, but they get to the other side of the island. I don't know if somebody else sailed the boat around or how that worked. But, uh, and then they go up to the other coastline, and it's really not very far before you come to Pamphylia. And so it looks like he said, that's it, man, I'm out. <laughs> you know, I gotta, I'll walk home from here or whatever, you know. But he goes to Pamphylia and he just drops out, goes back to Jerusalem, whatever, uh, because that was just too much for him to handle, a third of the way into it. And so, uh, you know, Mark, we don't know what all he had to go through, but he's going through some rough stuff, no doubt. So in chapter 15, go back to Acts 15. And look at verse 36. Now they leave John Mark, and then they go finish their journey. They go all along Macedonia and all this, and you know, that region, I don't know all the names of the cities. And then they end up coming back to Antioch and giving a report, and everything's great. Okay, And then in Acts 15, verse 36, it says, and some days after, Paul said unto Barnabas, Let us go again and visit our brethren in every city where we have preached the word of the Lord and see how they do. And Barnabas determined to take with them John, whose surname was Mark. But Paul thought it no good, not good to take him with them who departed from them from Pamphylia and went not with them to the work. And the contention was so sharp between them that they departed asunder one from the other, and so Barnabas took Mark and sailed into Cyprus, and Paul chose Silas and departed, being recommended by the brethren unto the grace of God. And he went through all Syria and Cilicia, confirming the churches. Okay, so we're not saying who's right or who's wrong. Okay, the Bible doesn't even determine that. It's just like, hey, they decided they're not going to be able to go together. Barnabas was determined. I'm going to take my, my nephew, or I'm going to give him a second chance. We'll just take it. We'll take the boat and we'll go real slow <laughs> or something. You know, I don't know. Uh, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll make it a little bit easier on him or whatever. OK, so he actually takes the ship. So here's my speculation. Remember, they're from they they seem to have some money. My speculation is probably his ship. I don't know that for sure. But uh, but the Apostle Paul and Silas, they're on foot. They're kind of going backwards all throughout the land. And they're not at the sea at this time, whereas Barnabas is the one who takes uh, John Mark and goes to, to Cyprus. Okay, so, so I think he said, well, I'm going to take my ship with me. <laughs> so so he, they went, and, 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 then, and then the Apostle Paul takes Silas, and they go on, on foot. Okay, so now they've split up, but they continue journeying. They continue serving the Lord. Look, by the way, it's possible to not be able to see eye to eye with somebody and, not, and, and be like, hey, we're kind of going two different directions but God bless you. Go serve the Lord. Go get people saved. We're just going to have to do it in two different, you know, churches. Okay? That's totally fine. It happens all the time. We've got a church in our uh, town in Iola. There's actually three Baptist churches. It used to be four Baptist churches. In Iola, 4,000 people, four, four Baptist churches. <laughs> One of them shut down. One of them is, uh, I think, Southern Baptist. I don't think it's Southern. Maybe uh, some other kind of uh, Baptist church. 
And then two of us are actually King James only independent fundamental Baptist churches. And yet we don't ever get together and we don't we don't share like in uh, soul winning events or we don't go together for conferences. We kind of just run with different groups. You know, they tend to be wanting to go more of a contemporary style of worship and all this kind of stuff. I don't speak bad about them. I don't take shots at them. I don't, you know, try to stop them from doing what they're doing. I just say like, hey, you're going that way. We're going this way. Praise the Lord. When we see each other, you know, we we talk to each other and we're happy and we're talking about ministry and all this kind of stuff. But we're just not, you know, it's like, I don't want to say who's who, but, you know, I'm, I'm Paul and they're Barnabas. <laughs> and so, uh, and so like, you know, wh- whatever the case, we're just kind of going to, the, and it's fine. That's okay. You know, this is why it's so cool. Like, let me, okay, without getting too personal, like the, 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 the new IFB, everybody in here is familiar with old IFB, new IFB, which is kind of a silly thing, like independent fundamental Baptist. It doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to be any, the denominations, splits, you know, uh, fellowships within that. But, hey, we all have friends that we hang out with and everything. So long story short, some of you guys know that a movement started, uh, became referred to as the new IFB, and they were very close, like cookie-cutter church, like everybody, they did everything the same way and all that. And it still, it, it still exists. But something happened in the last few years where it really split up in lots of different, like, splinters, if you will. Okay, and these group, this group broke from them, and that group broke from them. But here's the thing. I've always said this, like, praise the Lord, because here's the deal. Like, they couldn't see eye to eye on certain things, and so they split up. But you know what? These guys are still big on the soul winning. They're still big on some of the great doctrines that, that, that I love and that I still hold to. They're real big on the family, and they typically have integrated churches, uh, churches like this, which I think is great. You know, they got a lot of like-mindedness, but they're just like, for whatever reason, we're not, you know, we're kind of going separate ways. Every time that happens, it's kind of like scattering, <laughs> you know, scattering uh, to where the gospel is just being spread out more and more instead of people sitting around making this one big church, one big community where a lot of times they get kind of stagnant and they get kind of, you know, in, into the programs and all this kind of stuff instead of going out and, and doing the work and splitting up and starting new churches and all that kind of stuff. And so, you know, who, who cares if someone doesn't see eye to eye with you exactly have all the exact beliefs, you know, maybe you think this person's too mean, or maybe you think this person's too nice, or whatever, look, all right, so just have your church, do the work that you're supposed to do, get people saved, and go on serving the Lord, and let them serve the Lord their way, (laughs) you know what I mean? Now, obviously, correct, if they got some major doctrine, they're preaching like a, 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 a bad salvation gospel, or something like that, well, then you can correct them, but otherwise, Uh, this split where obviously there was some contention and obviously it wasn't even doctrinal or anything like that it was just like hey I'm not going to take John Mark he's going to slow us down he already failed us once he's going to let us down again and I'm not going to do that and so they just went different ways it's it's okay you know Uh, life goes on in fact the story gets better because what we find is that years later Paul in the original text that I read we read here Paul says at, later on in his in his ministry, right? He's in prison. He's he's uh, he's been persecuted really badly and all this, and he's kind of left alone. All these people have forsaken him, and he's ca- telling he's like, all I have here with me is Luke, and he's talking to Timothy, and he's like, oh yeah, and, and by the way, bring Mark because he's profitable for me for the ministry, profitable t- to me for the ministry, and so he's asking for Mark. So whatever happened in that time, Mark becomes profitable for the ministry. Now, I believe, let's go ahead and read that, actually. 2 Timothy 4. Second Timothy 4, verse 9. Do thy diligence to come shortly unto me, for Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world, and is departed unto Thessalonica, Grecians, uh, Crescens to Galatia, Titus to Dalmatia, and it doesn't even mean all those guys necessarily left him in a bad attitude or something. It's just like they're not with him right now. Okay, he says, only Luke is with me. Take Mark and bring him with thee, for he is profitable to me for the ministry. And so uh, as you keep on reading, he tells them some other things he wants. Like it's obviously winter time now, and he's getting cold in the prison. And so he's like, the cloak that I left at Troas, 
uh, with Carpus, when thou comest, bring that with thee. And then he says this, in the books, but especially the parchments. Okay, so he's wanting this material, whether it's so that he could write on it or there's stuff that he could read or whatever. He's wanting this stuff so he can continue doing the ministry and all that. Okay, so, so here's what I think happens with Mark. I believe he grew up talking with the apostles in his home. You know, here he is. His mom is housing these apostles. They're preaching. They're praying. They're doing all this stuff. Mark's probably looking at these guys like, man, these are my heroes. Which, by the way, now, now I think that historically churches have, churches have made some Christians to be too big of heroes, if that makes sense where it becomes almost like man worship and it's just like, wait a minute, like we're all supposed to be serving Christ. Like, you know, don't make, don't make this person a, a, you know, some, a God or something like that. But you know what? There's nothing wrong with saying like, Hey, I look up to this preacher. I look up to this man of God who's done this and done this great thing or that. as opposed to saying, I look up to this basketball player. I look up to this movie star. I look up to this, like, what do you want your children, who do you want them to aspire to be like, right? There's nothing wrong with saying, hey, listen to this preaching, and the kids are like, oh, I love pre I love that preacher. I love Pastor so-and-so, and they like listening to him and all that stuff, and you're talking respectful about them in, their, in your house. Man, nothing wrong with that. That's great. I feel like the John Mark probably grew up in that environment, Okay, you probably grew up, hey, these guys, man, they're giving it all for the Lord, and I want to be just like Uncle Barnabas whenever I grow up, and Paul, and, and he's studying all the things that he can study, and he's following, you know, uh, uh, he's probably got his hands on a whole bunch of notes and records and all this kind of stuff, and maybe he was the kind of guy that sits down and says, you know what, I'm going to keep a journal, and I'm going to write about these things that happened, and I'm going to talk to uh, you know, I'm going to read these accounts of Matthew that we've got, pre that we've got copies of, and I'm going to talk to these eyewitnesses. I'm going to talk to Peter, and I'm going to talk to, you know, these guys, James and John, who sat down uh, with uh, Jesus and, and, and spoke with him and, and listened to his teaching. And so he began to compile all this, which I believe under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost, that's why it's in the Bible. But he began to come up with this and put together something that we, you know, again, only 10%, is different from the other ones, but still that 10% is important to us. When we're reading the Bible, there's some things that you can only find in Mark that you can't find in the other Gospels. And what a blessing to be able to read that. And the work that went into that, again, under the Holy, uh, inspiration of the Holy Ghost, but the work that went into that is profitable. And then I don't know what he did for the Apostle Paul from that point on, but it was profitable. Paul's getting older. Paul's you know, getting to where he can't do things. He's in prison. And he calls up John Mark, and now John Mark is able to come, and he's able to help him, and he's able to be profitable to the ministry. I think it was probably a great pleasure for him to be able to go with them on that missionary journey. But you know what? I think he probably realize, didn't realize how physically challenging it was going to be. And he got... You know, he was gung-ho. He started out, I'm going to do this. I'm going to turn the world upside down. I'm going to be like these guys. I'm going to learn how to preach like them, and I'm going to win souls like them and all that. And then he started out, and he was like, man, this, these days are long. <laughs> this is hard work, and my feet hurt, and I'm hungry, and I'm sick, and I can't spend another, set, uh, another day in that, in that ship. I believe it got really rough for him. And again, this is maybe, possibly, I might be reading into it, but this is probably a kid who really was a little bit softer, maybe hadn't really had a rough life because he had, he was one of those kids that actually had money and he had means. And so maybe that he didn't realize how hard this was going to be for him. 149 miles. That's how long it was. I just re realized I did write it down. <laughs> okay. 149 miles of walking across Cyprus and, and, uh, and, and all these expectations that were upon him. You know, can you imagine? The Apostle Paul is like, hey, I don't have time to go cook a meal. Hey, will you go find us something to eat? You know, and he's like, hey, will you, uh, you wash, you know, wash these clothes, man. We need it. They're starting to smell bad. <laughs> you know? And he's probably sending them on journeys. Hey, go down to that church and tell them that we'll be back tomorrow at this time to preach. And, and he's probably sending them on, on errands. By the time they got to Pamphylia, John Mark's like, man, this is rough. This is rough. Now, here's the thing. Like, we're in a church that's, that likes working for the Lord. Now, I, I actually was convicted about this as I'm studying the, the book of I love reading Acts because Acts gets me so fired up remembering, like, what the church is all about, what we're supposed to be doing. 
right, and about giving all and about sacrificing, doing all this stuff. And I got kind of fired up, and honestly, I was convicted, and I was thinking, man, I don't really do that much. I'm not, like, living my life like the Apostle Paul and Barnabas. Now, I would say this, and the Bible actually addresses this. They weren't married, (laughs) okay? And there is something a little bit different, like whenever you have to take care of the needs of your family and all that, and this is why that is the office of a pastor, which is actually a little bit different than the office of an evangelist and a missionary that travels around, but that's a whole other can of worms, okay? So, but regardless, I started kind of feeling guilty about like, man, I'm just not doing enough for the Lord. Like, I need to really be dedicating more time, and I'm going to be, uh, you know, cutting some other things out of my life that have, have taken up some time. And then I think about this, and I'm like, man, I feel like that, but you know there's some people that probably came to, have come to this church. Maybe they're visitors that they don't come anymore. You know, or maybe there's somebody who's here, and you're coming, and maybe you like the church, but you're just like, man, these guys are a little crazy. <laughs> I mean... I mean, they're going soul winning Sunday afternoons. Did somebody forget to tell them about Baptist nap time? You know, International Baptist nap time. Uh, you know, when do these guys stop? When do they eat? Thursday nights, you know, out there at five o'clock. And then they come back and then there's preaching at seven. And then they don't, and then they go to eight o'clock. You know how many hours that is without food? <laughs> I mean, there might be some people that are like, these guys are a little bit nuts. I mean, these guys are like all about these these hardcore standards and, and sacrifices and living for the Lord and being radicals. There could be people that are just like, you know what? This is a different, this is, this is, this is not for me. Like, I guess my life is just going to have to be one of ease and, and all that. Look, man, don't give up on service. You don't have to be exactly like somebody else. Like, you don't have to look at that person and say, I'm going to be just like that person because you probably won't ever be. And you'll probably fail if you try. But that doesn't mean that God doesn't have a plan for you. And that doesn't mean if you don't keep on working at whatever the Lord's given you, whatever skill it is, whatever desire in your heart, what can I do to serve the Lord? Man, do it. Find a way to use it for the Lord. And because God knows the heart and God's watching and he wants you to to give of yourself. And at the end, he's going to bless the works that you do. He's going to use it for his work. Okay, He he can do the impossible. He doesn't really need any of us to do his work. Like he could get the work done if he wanted to. He created the whole world in six days. I mean, come on. Uh, he, could, he doesn't really need us, but he wants us to do the work. He wants us to give of ourselves. He wants us to try. And look, if you're just willing to commit a little bit and a little bit more and a little bit more, he's going to keep using you. And one day you're going to find that you're this person that's getting a lot done for the Lord. You're the one that's profitable. And you're the one who is trying to influence other people and encourage other people to step up in their Christian life. But don't freak out because people are doing too much and it's too hard for you. And so you're going to bail out at Pamphylia. Man, just take it easy. If you need a Barnabas, hang around a Barnabas. <laughs> you know, if you need to take a little break, take a little break. Uh, but, but you need to be in this for the long haul. Okay, so here are my conclu- concluding thoughts here. If you want to serve the Lord, I believe that you are valuable to the work. Now, I don't mean to say that like you are somebody. <laughs> Look at your neighbor and say, I am somebody. Like, I'm not talking about Joe Osteen stuff, okay? I'm just talking about this. If, if God created you, and if you are willing to give of yourself to do something for the Lord, you're valuable. Amen. You're valuable. That's right. He's going to use you. Now, if you're not doing anything, or if you're counterproductive, you're hindering the work of God, you're living in sin, you're going against, you're trying to hinder the work of God, he might get you out of the picture. Because you're, you know, what the Bible says, a castaway. Like, you're... You're uh, like that branch that's not bearing any fruit, like it's not good for anything but to be cast out and burned in the fire. Like the salt that's lost its savor, it's no good but to be trampled on by the foot of, under the foot of men. Like you don't want to be that guy, but you want to be giving and say, Lord, I'm willing to give of myself if you'll just let me. If you'll show me what I can do, you'll help me out, help me be the person that I need to be, not trying to be somebody else, and help me contribute to the work, then, then uh, I'm willing to do it. Guess what? You're valuable and he's going to use you. Here's another important thing that we all should uh, consider. Don't fret about being second string. You know what I mean? Second string, like like when I played baseball, like I wanted to be the starter because that's just what everybody wanted to do. And I didn't want to play on the bench. Guess what, man? Every sport I played in, I was on the bench. (laughs) Okay? I'm just telling you that I was. (laughs) All right? But I wanted to be the, the first string. I wanted to be on there. I wanted to be playing. But here's the thing, like show up for your team. Be supportive. 
Wear the jersey. Carry the water. <laughs> you know, it's okay. We need those people. And do that, and hey, the day is going to come where you're called up to the big leagues. <laughs> the day is going to come wherever somebody needs you, you're going to shine, and it's going to be like, wow, you're profitable for the ministry. You just have to have a heart that wants to serve the Lord. And then appreciate the journey, okay? You go through trials, hardships, experiences. Like, like the longer you get experienced as a Christian, it, find out, hey, it is rough, but it's worth it. You ever read Matthew 5, like Sermon on the Mount? It's all about, hey, blessed are you if, what, you're poor in spirit. Blessed are you. It even goes so far as to say if you're persecuted, like you're blessed, you're happy, you're going to enjoy it. Just hang in there and go through it. You're going to be like, wow, God can bless me in ways that I never could have figured out. Okay? <laughs> Appreciate the journey. Appreciate the relationships that you build. And appreciate the Barnabases in your life that take you under wing and say, well, help, let me help you out. Let me show you how to get better at this. Don't think that you have to be just like others who may receive more glory for what they do. Be a minister. You know what the idea of a minister is? A servant. You're serving people. And the Bible says that he's a, that's least among you. You know, let him be your servant. Like, I mean, let him be your, how's it go? <laughs> anyway, uh, he's the greatest among you. Let him be your servant. Okay, so... Uh, so the idea is that the, the, the lower we get, the greater we are for the Lord. Be faithful and do your best. And when you're called up, be ready to do the job and do it well, whatever it is that God's called you to do. Not everybody could write the gospel according to Mark, right? That was a job that God had for Mark to do. And so he was profitable for the ministry. He just had to hang in there. All right, let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word and thank you for this church. I do thank you for the great... Uh, men and women here who uh, love you and are dedicated to you and want to serve you and are willing to take others who want to learn and want to grow and to take them under wing and to invest in them and to help so that we all can work together as one body serving you, Lord, because it's all about you. It's not about us. Help us to step out of the way and we must increase and uh, we must decrease and you must increase, Lord. Help us to keep that mindset. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.